You're watching the 2021 Forager Investor Roadshow. Welcome to the Forager 2021 Investor Roadshow. I'm Nadine Blaney from Ausbiz, and I'll be your host for today's event. Shortly, we'll be joined by Forager's Chief Investment Officer, Steve Johnson, and then we'll hear presentations from both the International Shares Fund and the Australian Shares Fund teams for approximately 20 minutes each. After this, the team will be joining us for a Q&A session. So to submit any questions you may have, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen anytime throughout today's event. Today's presentation is general advice only. We have not taken any personal circumstances into account. If you are looking for advice, please speak to a financial advisor. So let's get started. Steve, welcome. What a year Forager has had. You started this business almost 12 years ago, and I know you've had some difficult times in 2019 and 2020, but this past year must be one of your best. Hi, Nadine, and welcome everyone. Uh, yes, 2021 was a very, very pleasing year. Uh, you don't expect 80% returns for a year in your lifetime, let alone for them to happen regularly, so people should temper their expectations. Uh, but it has restored or, or it has uh, got the long-term performance records for both of our funds to where we want them to be. And I think it's been a reflection of a number of years of hard work here that weren't necessarily turning up in the results. I think successful funds management is all about getting the, the people right, about getting your process right, and then having the market opportunity. And all three of those things came together for us in 2021. Well, Steve, could you talk us through those three aspects in more detail? Yeah, I started the business back in 2009. We had one fund and we raised $10 million for it and I put all of my own money into the fund. So, you know, the alignment and the people side of things was very, very simple. Today, we manage $480 million across two funds and we invest money all around the world. Getting that people alignment side of things is more complicated at a bigger size. And we've been working really hard behind the scenes to get those things right. We changed the fee structure of the International Shares Fund a few years back where we cut the base fee and put in place a performance fee. We've aligned the staff remuneration with the, the fund outcomes internally, and that's enabled us to attract some really high caliber people. And hopefully as you go through today's presentation, you'll see that we've got a, a good team of people here and that a lot of the good results that you're seeing are coming from uh, different people working in different markets and applying our philosophy to different parts of the world. The process side of things I've always been really big on. Uh, we've had a, a stock selection framework almost since we started the, the funds management business. And I've been fully aware of the importance of getting all of that due diligence done. The difference I think, and the thing we've had to put a lot of work into is applying that at scale and putting together portfolios of good ideas in a way that that portfolio works. And it's not just about individual stock picking, it's about managing the portfolio liquidity, it's about managing the diversity of different types of ideas within that portfolio. Uh, and it's about making sure that that portfolio is going to perform in a range of different market environments. And again, it's something we've been working really hard on over the past few years. So you get the people right and you get the process right, and then you need a, a market that plays into your hands. And, and that was probably the biggest contributing factor through 2021. It was an extremely volatile year. There were numerous bouts of, of market panic in different sectors and across different types of businesses. And that allowed us to put those people and processes to work you know, in a range of different markets and, and we've deployed that capital multiple times throughout the year. And the combination of those three things has translated into some wonderful results. Well, we'll be back later in the roadshow. Now it's time to hear from portfolio managers, Gareth Brown and Harvey Mugotti and senior analyst, Chloe Stokes from the Forager International Shares Fund team. Thanks Nadine and welcome everyone. Sorry we couldn't get around to see you in person this year. There are some important attributes that we think are foundational to any edge we have in investing. We have the freedom to invest in stocks regardless of their market capitalization, sector, or where they are in the world. We have an approach that always puts valuation first without restricting ourselves to value stocks, low, low PE stocks, or dividend payers. And we have the ability to run a portfolio 
a concentrated portfolio of best ideas while being acutely aware of the benefits of diversification by size, sector, and geography. So this kind of flexibility is always where we're looking for an edge. But wow, did this flexibility pay off in 2021? Yes, that's right. It was a year where being different and we were being flexible definitely worked. The market was moving with such ferocity throughout the last 18 months, both to the downside and the upside, that the optimal strategy was not just to place your bets in March and let them roll forward, but constantly refresh and update the portfolio, particularly when the market was giving you new ideas and new opportunities all the time. We worked as fast as we could without trying to set, without sacrificing any quality of research to try to take advantage of these movements. It worked really well for us over the past 12 months, but of course we ended up missing opportunities that we wish we could have bought and owned since that, that period. Yes, you'd think we wouldn't have much to complain about after such a successful year, but the process itself has actually been quite frustrating. I've lost count of the number of times we'd bring up an idea and then the share price would almost immediately run 20 or 30%. So for every new idea that you've seen in the portfolio, there were a bunch that we started working on or even nearly finished working on and we missed because they just moved so quickly. Yeah, it, indeed, it's frustrating. But it's important to keep in mind that investment records are put together by what you own, not what you don't own. And I'm not all that convinced that if we had have got two or three times as many ideas into the portfolio, we would have done better, learn and adapt. Look, as we touched on, moving with speed has been the really important factor this year. Shifting focus was the key. Sitting still was not the invest, optimal investment process. The first six months coming out of the pandemic low in March 2020, it was really, the easy wins were really in quality stocks. Yeah, that's right. And by the time November came around and the US election, and more importantly, the vaccine news, you had a whole different type of segment of the market that started to perform. The airlines, the travel stocks, some of the beaten up cyclicals, they all had their day in the sun through the back end of the year. Here's moves upwards, you know, 50 to 100% moves in a very short span of time. Uh, the back half of the year was a bit different. It was much more choppy when it came to what type of factors worked in the market. It was more about idiosyncratic ideas and bottoms up stock picking than pit placing your bets on either side of the reopening trade. Let's now talk about some of the fund's most important contributors over 2021. It was a very lopsided year. We had some big winners. We'll get to some of those in a moment. But perhaps more importantly, there was this really long tail of meaningful contributors, more than two dozen meaningful contributors to the portfolio and no large detractors. So of course the bull market was crucial here. I don't wanna downplay the significance of that tailwind to, to the year we've just had, um, but there are some themes that worked very well for us. And so let's highlight some of those. Probably the first one to talk about is, is so stocks going through SPACs, IPOs, and, and big raising. So we're talking about companies raising money in one form or another in the market. There were seven meaningful contributors there, really, really important to the fund's returns, and they would have been material, materially poorer without those re returns. What I think the team can be really proud of here is that we identified this as a severely underfished pond at the start of the year, and we resourced appropriately, and it's paid off meaningfully. Harvey, you deserve most of the credit for this. Thanks. Yes, it's true. You know, SPACs, we've said this many times in the past, they can be a minefield. We completely understand that a big portion of the investment community just doesn't bother looking at the space. A lot of the companies are coming to the market with limited revenues, no real track record. And, you know, there's many question marks regarding <laughs> what the future looks like for them. Our approach has been to turn over a number of rocks. You know, we've looked at dozens and dozens of companies and, you know, we invested very, very selectively. The, from the few investments we did make, we've been very fortunate. You know, we picked high quality companies with solid historical track records. And most of them have gone up quite significantly since we put in the portfolio. We think it's an underfished pond even now, but you do have to be careful. We remain positive on the ones we still hold. Another important group for us was quality compounders some that we've owned for a few years now and others that we had the opportunity to add during the crisis. These compounders are usually larger businesses and we think of them like a portfolio base. So we always want to have a chunk of the portfolio in these kinds of businesses as they improve the risk return profile of the portfolio over time. 
This year, Zebra and CDW were among the contributors in this bucket. And another stock that I think was an undiscovered quality compounder is Farfetch. Oh, I think this one's a great example of understanding your investment edge. Can you outline the investment case as you saw it before we bought the stock? Yes. So Farfetch is the global platform for the luxury industry. Our most successful investments tend to start with what we think the market got wrong. For this, you need to have a variant perception. And as a female, you can have a bit of an advantage here in certain types of stocks. There are a bunch of stocks out there that you might know really well from a consumer perspective that most other analysts just don't. And this Farfetch was a really good example of this. When we started looking at it last year, it was valued at around 6 billion US dollars. At that price, there had to be some big question marks around whether this was going to be the dominant platform in the industry. And that's fair enough because from afar, it looked like just another online luxury retailer with no real competitive advantage and the threat of Amazon lurking around every corner. But I have the view that not only does Farfetch add value to the luxury brands that it works with, but it also adds value to the industry as a whole. So for that reason, I was confident that it would end up as the dominant platform. And if it did, $6 billion is a really low valuation for this business. You can see on the chart that revenue estimates for 2021 have increased pretty significantly since our purchase in mid last year, as people started getting more comfortable with the Farfetch business model. It basically shows my thesis on one page. Analysts and the market as a whole were just really underestimating how much consumers would buy from the Farfetch website. We sold out around the highs early this year, so it was a really short holding period for us, but it contributed significantly to returns for the year. I think it's fair to say that Farfetch would never have been in my circle of competence. I, last time I bought a handbag for my wife, I let my five-year-old daughter pick it. Recovery stocks is an area I know a bit about. That's the third area I'd like to highlight. They added meaningfully for us uh, this year, especially around that second quarter as the vaccines emerged and their efficacy came to light. No one recovery play sits right at the top of the list of contributors, but eight of them together work very well to add meaningfully to move the needle. I think it's really worth remembering here how myopic the market can get at the period of peak panic, particularly with these sort of cyclical stocks. That's right. Linamar, I think, is a great example of that. Yeah, Linamar is a manufacturer of precision equipment, chiefly for the automotive sector. And it's one of those businesses the market can get very wrong at times. Yes, it's cyclical, but it's also a structural grower. And when a left field event like COVID comes along, all investors see is that cyclicality and they dump the stock. Don't get me wrong, I don't think we played this one particularly well, uh, but it was evident and obvious that it would recover and we've benefited from that. This business has been unprofitable just one year in its 35-year listed history, which is pretty impressive for a so-called cyclical stock. That was in 2009. 2020, they actually had to shut plants for months on end and they had one unprofitable quarter and were decently profitable for the full year. Look, the, the, the global shortage of computer chips is having an impact here on the whole automotive sector globally. Uh, it, it is definitely capping what would have been more explosive growth recently. I think the effect of that is to just elongate the good part of the cycle Linamar remains one of our top 10 positions, which should tell you everything you need to know about my thoughts on, on value and outlook. The other thing I wanted to add was, was the transition to electric vehicles, which has long been viewed as a risk for this business. Uh, in the last quarter, more than a, a third of new business wins were on electrified vehicles. So I think they're making that transition beautifully. So again, it's, this is an example of the sort of stock that the market gets really, really wrong in a panic, and I think they're actually still underestimating this one. So that's the recovery stocks. It would be remiss of us not to mention some of our hard-to-bucket idiosyncratic ideas, uh, particularly those towards the top of the list, and most importantly, Celsius. Yes, well, ultimately, you know, it's all about finding those great individual stock ideas that really make a difference. You know, our top performer for the year and perhaps one of the most successful investments throughout the fund's history was Celsius, the energy drinks company. It's a great example of riding your winners and not selling too soon, but it's also a great example, and we'll get to it, 
about recycling into ideas, even once you sold out and you, the open market gives you another exciting opportunity. So what is Celsius? A few of you may already be familiar with the name, but it's essentially an energy drinks company that's disrupting a market with very high margins that has been dominated by a few key players. We first looked at this business at the start of 2020, and we saw a company that's growing top line at the 30, 40% level, but trading at discounted values. You know, we couldn't really understand it, so we did the work. Obviously, we got pretty comfortable that this was going to continue. We saw that from the industry data that Celsius was taking share and that the feedback from customers was extremely positive. We thought it was a great opportunity and we bought it in February of last year, just before COVID hit. We added at the lows as well. So all of this has actually came into fruition. The company doubled their sales over the past year. It's been a significant contributor to the year. Clearly great stock picking there, Harvey. And if someone had have just bought this at the same time that we first bought it and held it, that have done very, very well. I think you've also had a lot of value here in terms of the trading around the ebbs and flows in stock. Yeah, we've seen that across our portfolio over this year. It's been a volatile one and the market's given us opportunities on both sides of the equation. You know, we originally bought this stock back when it was trading at $5 at the start of last year. It had a great run. As of February of this year, it was trading around the $60, $70 range. And we thought that it had maybe run ahead of itself, along with many parts of the market that are the faster growing segment. So we, we sold a position and you know, subsequently in, between March and May, a lot of these stocks sold off quite heavily and derated. All of a sudden, it was back to trading in the 40s. At the same time as this was happening, we track industry data and we saw that their sales growth was accelerating significantly. It was stepping up from 100% year in year growth to 200% year in year growth. And we felt the market was perhaps missing this. We bought the position again, and thankfully it's made us a good amount of money the second time around. We still hold this, the position at, at this point. So let's now move on to our best prospects for the current year. Any important themes, team? Well, yes, especially you know in July, we saw small caps sell off significantly in the US. You saw the bellwethers, the fang names, you know, the S&P 500, hit new highs every single day of this month. But a lot of the smaller names had serious moves down. So as they started underperforming, we actually used that opportunity to top up some of our favorite names that we either already own or pick some new positions. And we just talked about how we did that with Celsius over the past you know, couple of weeks. The pullback means that our portfolio has a lot more upside now than it did a few weeks ago. So this is something that we have always try to do and we will continue to do focus on areas of the market that are beaten down or temporarily ignored for whatever reason you know we've talked about SPACs presenting a good opportunity but there's a lot of spin-offs that are coming to market recently and there's a lot of new raisings and ipos these sometimes are very well received and the stocks trade up significantly and sometimes they're forgotten for a period of three to six months it is within that period that we try to take advantage of the opportunity if it's a name that we like because the market is focused and looking elsewhere. So Chloe, what about yourself? Another type of idea that we're always interested in is long-term growers, especially when they're misunderstood and mispriced. UK-based online retailer Boohoo is a great example of a business that's going really well and a share price that's not reflecting that. It's hard to deny the strength of the Boohoo business model its sales have increased more than 50% per annum over the past 10 years. And that whole time, it's been both profitable and cash generative. However, the company has had some ESG issues over the past 12 months, which is what presented the opportunity to us. While management have taken a number of steps in the right direction to rectify these issues, the stock is simply uninvestable for a chunk of the market. While it may not ever be a darling stock, if the business keeps growing like this, the valuation gap will have to close at some point. And we've got a number of other examples of this in the portfolio. What are you most excited about, Gareth? I think some of those recovery stocks, some of the cyclicals, particularly the higher quality ones, I think they have a long way to run still. We have this weird all or nothing sort of market. Back in February and March, the US bond yield started its move from one and a half percent to two and a half percent and everyone all anyone could talk about was inflation then the delta strain comes along cyclicals get punished bond yields fall again i think it's important we just look past the noise we've talked about linamar already motor point the car dealer in the uk i think it belongs in the same group we own uh, 
online travel retailer lastminute.com, which is heavily exposed to a recovery in, in leisure travel in Europe. And we also own the airport in Vienna, which is linked to some of the same themes. Look, there's no doubt this Delta strain has been as has upset part of the thesis. It's given everyone pause for concern. But I think there's a massive catch-up period here of holidaying and partying and getting back to normal. I remain very much long hedonism. I think that there's some very good signs coming out in the UK, in particular, that they are emerging through this Delta strain. And I think these businesses that I've mentioned, I think it's very likely that in 12 months' time, they'll be facing significantly better business conditions than they do today. If I'm wrong, and it takes 24 months or 36 months, they've got the balance sheets to survive until they can prosper. But one way or another, I think life's getting back to normal and we're all going to have a lot of catch up, catch up to do. And I, I want to own some names that are really linked to that. 100%. One area that I'm personally digging into is ad tech advertising technology that is i won't talk any names yet but you should keep her out for our upcoming monthly and quarterly reports as we're definitely going to be talking about this stock that we put in the portfolio recently it's an exciting industry at the moment digital video advertising continues to grow and connected televisions are becoming more common in households this allows advertisers to target the right kind of person for the right kind of ad leading to higher returns on investment for someone who wants to place an ad in front of an eyeball we love this business and we're excited about the prospects that it holds. Now, it just goes to show that even though the markets are sitting at all-time highs and much higher than they were 12 months ago, the environment is constantly shifting. Technology is constantly evolving. There is always something that has a lot of pent-up upside the market is forgetting about or just starting to realize and find out about. So we're very excited about the new positions we put in the portfolio and you know the prospects for the returns in over the coming 12 months. Thanks, Harvey. Thanks, thanks, Chloe. Look, 2021 was a year like none we've ever experienced. It's unlikely to be repeated anytime soon. But the process that led to that very good year, the flexibility, the speed, the ability to go where others are unable to go, they will have payoffs in the years ahead. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. And I really hope we get to see you in person next year and have a laugh about all this. Back to you, Nadine. There are some names in the Forager International Shares Fund that you don't often hear from many other fund managers. So those of you who might have questions for the team, please submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the team will be joining us at the end of today's roadshow to answer any questions you may have. Now it's time to hear from Steve Johnson and senior analysts Alex Shevelev and Gaston Amoros from the Forager Australian Shares Fund. Thanks, Nadine, and thanks, Chloe, Gareth, and Harvey for some wonderful returns over the past couple of years. That international fund's been stealing the limelight somewhat, but our Australian fund is the one that I started with back in 2009, the little baby of mine, and its returns are extremely important. So the recovery over the past 12 months has been something that I'm very happy about. Uh, it's important to put it into the context here of three and five year returns that are still just below the index. And we're very focused on making sure those long term returns uh, well above market, like our since inception return is here. But we needed to take a big step in the right direction. And we've done that over the past 12 months. At last year's roadshow, we highlighted a, a number of areas in the portfolio that we needed to perform well for us some deep value stocks that we needed to extract that value out of, uh, some turnarounds that we were confident were well underway with their turnaround, some dividend paying profitable stocks where we thought that cash generation was being underappreciated by the market and some small cap growth stocks that we had high hopes for. Really all four of those areas have contributed strongly to returns over the past 12 months. Alex, I'll bring you in here. We might start with the value resurrection category. That's right. So we had a couple of stocks that contributed uh, quite negatively to the FY20 results. And chief amongst these, Thorn, iSelect and NZME. Now, during that, during the FY21 period, both a better starting price and some, some progress in the businesses themselves have meant that this category has actually been a very substantial contributor in FY21 as well. Now, extracting value has been important, as you suggest, and nowhere more so than in Thorn Group. 
Yes, it's a stock that we've put in an inordinate amount of time with over the past couple of years, really trying to optimize the value that came out of the company. And we've had some success over the past 12 months. Those efforts included a trip to the, the takeovers panel to try and stop the company issuing a number of shares to its largest shareholder at a price that we thought was unfair. This is not the outcome that we anticipated when we very first invested in Thorn, but we've been paid eight and a half cents of fully frank dividends over the past 12 months. We've been able to exit the entire investment at just north of 21 cents. So almost 30 cents per share of value here. That's a long way north of the eight cents where it was trading just 12 months ago. And even the, the placement that we participated in back in 2019 at 24 cents a share. So it's been an important contributor to returns over the past 12 months. Now, the aim is obviously to buy investments that work for us over the long term. And perhaps the most pleasing part of the past year's returns is some of our long held investments that have performed very well for the portfolio over multiple years. Now, these three businesses, they've been in the portfolio for years. And in the last 12 months, there's really been an improvement both in the profitability of these businesses and in their recognition by the market as well. Now, chief amongst these, and Nero, it's been in the portfolio for more than 10 years. And in the last 12 months, both profits and the share price have really got a kick along from a US ad tech business that's been absolutely on a tear. We've had mainstream that we'll touch on a little bit later as well, that has been the subject of a bidding war. And we've also got RPM Global, which is the largest position in the fund at the moment and the most recent addition. Now, with a fresh pair of eyes, I might actually bring Gaston here to comment on RPM. Yes, thanks, Sheb. Having spent a, a good amount of time looking at technology names in Australia and offshore, RPM is a good example of two things that lead to great returns. A, it's a great business that ticks many of the boxes of what we like in software, high growth, high margins, good cash conversion, and B, timing. You bought it at a point in time when nobody was talking about the stock, so obviously you got a great entry price. To the extent that we can do more of these going forward, that is a winning combination, and, and you'll see it in the returns. And mainstream being one of our most successful investments ever in this fund. Uh, the international fund team are bragging about their Celsius investment and rightfully so, but this one is up there with the most successful that we have made in the business. It's one that we have also been working closely with, uh, less so about the underlying performance of the business here, but both we and the company's management team were frustrated that the progress that they were making at a business level wasn't being reflected in the share price. The logical outcome here was always a takeover by a larger player, and we'd actually done quite a bit of work around some of the big global uh, funds, administration businesses here, acquisitions that they'd done and what price they would typically pay. And when the shares were trading at 50 and 60 cents, we had an upside scenario in our case of $1.50 or $1.60 per share. We ended up with two of those global giants fighting it out for mainstream, and the final outcome here well, the final outcome that we've seen at the moment anyway is $2.80 per share. That's some seven times our initial IPO investment some five years ago, and it's been a wonderful returner for the fund. Let's go on to some of the newer additions now to the fund during the 2021 and late 2020 year. It was really a market upheaval situation through COVID in March of 2020, and the subsequent couple of months really provided a good opportunity to pick up some very interesting stocks while these were uh, dramatically down on prior levels. It's really been Forager's bread and butter. It's been really pleasing that we've been able to pick up so many businesses at very attractive prices. Now, the chief uh, lever there, the reason why we're able to purchase them at such attractive prices was the uncertainty that was prevailing at the time. So, for example, in a uh, Life360, which owns an app for tracking the movement of your teenage kids when they first start leaving the house, well, unsurprisingly, those teenage kids were not leaving the house during COVID. Lots of uncertainty from investors about when that movement will resume. Virgin UK, a UK-based bank, well, a lot of uncertainty around the mortgage repayments there and how if the UK economy was gonna go into more difficulty, those were gonna get repaid. And even more locally, Adair's group, uh, it's a physical retailer and an online retailer, but the physical retailing was closed. 
lots of uncertainty about what that meant for the profitability of the business. A lot of people talk about buying when everyone is panicking. It's a lot harder to do than it is to say. And I think as a fund manager, it's really important that you've got the structural alignment right to achieve that. For us, having a closed ended vehicle in March of last year was really important. It enabled us to invest every single cent of cash we had into the market in times of distress. And you can see that turning up in the results. It's also important to have the right psychological bent and something that's part of our DNA here at Forager is to be greedy when others are fearful and it's paid off a lot in 2021. Alex, it's been a great year, but there was one sector in which we lost money in 2021. That's right. It's a blemish on a pretty incredible year, but the mining services stocks really cost us in 2021. Now, usually there is a very close correlation between the health of mining companies and the health of mining services companies. And at the moment, over the last couple of months, there's been actually quite sharp diversion between the two. That diversion is big enough to drive a Caterpillar 793 truck through. It's really incredible considering the correlations over the last five to 10 years between these sectors. Now, the issue here for these mining services companies has been labor cost inflation. Uh, the ones we have, though, the investments that we've made in the space, they can pass on that labor cost inflation given enough time to their mining clients. Both McMahon and Parenti have that ability in their contracts. Meanwhile, with the mining sector doing very well, there's been a lot more new work added into the mix. So both of these companies, which total about 4% of the fund at the moment, have won four new contracts apiece this calendar year. One of the other pleasing aspects of last year that might not be so obvious to people is we've been able to clean up a number of small and illiquid investments that we had made that we were having trouble exiting. In addition to Thorn, uh, CTI, logistics and matrix composites and engineering are no longer in the portfolio. And combined with those big takeovers that we've talked about, it's freed up a lot of the portfolio here for reinvestment. We might move on now. I'll let Alex and Gaston talk about the new ideas coming into the portfolio and what they're most optimistic about for 2022. So really, the last couple of years, we've been finding some really interesting opportunities in the enterprise software space. Now, RPM is chief amongst them. It's the largest investment in the portfolio at the moment. Very nice, sticky revenue. It's, uh, it's been growing quite quickly, although initially that growth was hidden somewhat by accounting changes as the business was moving more towards a subscription model rather than an upfront perpetual license sale. And in this business, we've got a management team that's very well incentivized. Yes, yeah, Chev, um, because we never get tired of talking about software and quality. Another one we like in this category is Phineas. It is in the insurance space, but has very similar characteristics to RPM. Long-term contracts, sticky revenue, high incremental margins, and a management team which owns more than half of the company. In particular for Phineas, we expect next year, 2022, to be an important year as their customers recover from the pandemic and they have more money to spend on upgrading software systems. But maybe enough of the software chat, there are also plenty of reopening, more cyclical opportunities out there, especially now that everyone is talking about the virus. What do you think? Well, that's right. And chief amongst these in this particular fund is the travel exposure that we have. The largest of these is Tourism Holdings, an operator of recreational vehicles. Another is Experience Co that uh, operates skydiving and Great Barrier Reef trips. Now, of course, both of these businesses are uh, leveraged to an amount of inbound international tourism, and that has ground to pretty much zero. However, both of these businesses should actually come out of the pandemic in a better state and more profitable than when they went in. But what, what about the most recent lockdowns? How much do they affect these companies you're so excited about? Well, a couple of months of lost revenue is, of course, unhelpful, but it's not going to change the valuation picture here too dramatically for these businesses. Both of them, having been through the pandemic, now have some very flexible operations that they can tune up and down according to the number of people that they service. 
and they both have balance sheets that we believe will get them through to the reopening at the end of the tunnel here. Maybe Univail is another one that fits in well in this category. It is the owner of the Westwood franchise in Europe and in the US, and obviously malls were severely hit by the pandemic, but Univail has mostly premium assets in great locations, so we would expect a strong recovery as the pandemic subsides. Now this one, Gaston's had uh, some balance sheet question marks over the time, so wh where is that at the moment? Well, you're right, uh, debt used to be a major concern uh, and now it's becoming less of an issue as we're coming out of the pandemic and things are getting better, not worse. And second, don't forget these guys are selling assets at very good prices and that delivers the balance sheet and is accredited to the equity. All right, now let's talk some growing businesses here, Gaston, and chief amongst these AMA group, the panel beating business, obviously didn't have much work during the pandemic because we had people staying at home, getting into fewer accidents, which meant fewer cars for them to fix. Immediately after that, you had a new management team that came into the business and immediately started facing some issues around the inflation of labor cost and the inflation of parts costs as well. Now, the business remains a pretty key player in this panel beating space. It provides a service to the insurers that they're hard pressed to get at the same price elsewhere. And after reopening, we think it trades at less than a 10 times PE multiple. Okay, so I get it that it's cheap. Is there more to your thesis here other than pure valuation? So two things. Primarily, when we actually do reopen, we're going to be able to grow this business by acquisitions, folding more panel beating shops under the AMA umbrella and benefiting from the scale advantages that that creates. Uh, secondarily, we're going to also be in a position as this labor cost uh, uh, inflation subsides, where investors are rapidly looking forward to that future. Maybe moving on to the next category of uh, steady performers. In here, we like uh, things like Downer, especially now that it's a much simpler business after selling its capital intensive, highly volatile segments. The new downer is much more focused on steady, low capital businesses like maintaining roads and utility networks, very often for government clients, which are obviously much lower risk. And we don't think this more nuanced aspect of downer is properly priced in by the market. So you talk about pricing, Gaston, what are we actually paying for this new downer? Look, it, it is cheap and we think it is too cheap for what it is. To give you a sense, uh, it is currently trading on 13 times earnings versus the market on 22 times. So that is a decent upside uh, as they deliver on the new strategy. But perhaps that's enough on uh, new ideas for 2022 and I'll, I'll hand it over now to Steve. Thanks guys and special thanks to you, Alex, for really digging in over the past few years. We've got this uh, portfolio in the position that we want it to be in and back delivering the returns that we know it should be delivering over long periods of time. I hope that's given you an insight into some of the investments in the portfolio today, but perhaps more importantly than that, shows the progress that has been made over the past few years. Uh, I talked right at the start of today's webinar about people, process and opportunity, and hopefully you can see that this Australian Shares Fund is set up well on all of those fronts now. Not only do we have a collection of businesses that are performing as we want them to perform and heading in the right direction, but there's plenty of cash or soon to be cash in the portfolio to deploy into new ideas or take advantage of any market pullback if there is one. And with that, I'll hand back to Nadine. We will get to your questions in a moment, uh, but Steve, I'd like to ask you a few questions first. Steve, your Forager Australian Shares Fund still trades at a discount to its underlying value. Now that is despite the performance of the past year. Why is that? And, and what does it actually mean for potential investors? The whole listed fund space is a, a bit on the nose at the moment. It's gone from a darling sector to one uh, which is fairly common for these vehicles to trade at discounts to NCA. And historically, that has been something that has, has come and gone in, in waves, uh, the popularity of the space. So I think that's point number one. But for us, we've compounded that with some performance issues that the past 12 months has been really good, but the, the two years before that weren't. And, and I think that has 
uh, caused our vehicle to trade at a discount in line with the rest of the market. And that's not something that we want to see over time. The key solution for us is just to keep delivering good performance, number one. Uh, it's been 12 months of great performance. That needs to become three years and, and five years of, of good performance. And that long-term track record that we have here needs to be maintained relative to the wider market. And I think a really important thing with this vehicle is it is a trust rather than a listed investment company. And that means we pay out those returns to investors over time as we realize the underlying investments. If you look back at the history here, periods of good performance have ultimately been followed by big distributions from the fund, and that won't be any different in the future. For example, we've talked about mainstream today. It's been a very big returner for the fund. If that takeover goes through in October, that will be realized profits that get distributed out to investors at the end of the year. And I think ultimately that combination of returns and, and distributions should be something that's highly appealing to people. And we'll probably look back at this period if we can deliver on those returns, especially, you look back on this period uh, as a, a wonderful opportunity to buy a high-performing fund at a discount to its underlying value. Steve, the team have just talked us through some great results. Both funds have outperformed their benchmarks by more than 3% over decently long periods of time. What makes Forager different to the other actively managed funds in the market? I think there are three key differences and, and hopefully you've got a feel for them as we've gone through today's presentation. One of them is just philosophical. I think our ability to, to move the right way in these dysfunctional markets and to be aggressive when everyone else is panicking is a fundamental difference that you get with Forager compared to other people. I think to execute on that, staying small and nimble is really important as well. Uh, Size is a real killer in the funds management industry. And if we want to get out there and invest in these distressed markets, staying small has been really important. I think it's a bit like having a baby. You know, it, it's something that you can say no a thousand times to, and you say yes once and, and you're stuck with it for the rest of your life. So for us being disciplined here around, uh, around how much money we're willing to take on is super important. And then finally, I think our relationship with our clients is probably the most unique thing about our business. I had six or seven people call me when the market was hitting its lows in March of 2020. First, Steve, are you okay? You know, that personal relationship has been really important. They were worried about us as people more than their money to start with. But then secondly, just reinforcing the philosophy that this is your time to shine and make sure you're out there investing our money. I think that's really unique in this industry and we've worked hard to try and attract the right sorts of clients and I think we've seen over the past couple of years that that client behaviour has really helped us achieve the returns that we've achieved. Steve, markets are at or very near to all-time highs. What do you say to investors that are looking to invest right now? Look, I think there's still plenty of sensible things to be doing out there and hopefully you've seen that today. Obviously, we're not going to see the types of returns that we've seen over the past 12 months again, but relative to the, the interest rates that people are earning in banks, and, and I think relative to a lot of other asset classes out there, I still look at the equities landscape and say there's plenty of sensible things for us to be doing with your money. And secondly, to the extent that we do get a market pullback, you've seen over the past 12 months that that is really our time to shine. It's almost impossible to time these things. So I think getting your money invested in the market is really important. And even if we do have a significant pullback at some point in future, that's something you should get quite excited about as a forager client. And as we've been discussing, value investing had a great turnaround last year. Do you see this continuing into this current financial year? Look, I think it is set up for a further continuation of that uh, across the resources space and the banking space. I still think these businesses are, are relatively attractively priced. So I don't see any reason why it can't continue over the coming years. And, and particularly, I think, with a strong economy, we haven't really had that since 2009. It's been this spluttering recovery uh, from the global financial crisis. And I think inflation being a big risk, but we've finally got fiscal policy and monetary policy pushing together all around the world. So I think that environment is probably pretty positive for those traditional value stocks. Again, hopefully you've seen today at our, at our size, we don't need to be uh, stuck in any one particular part of the market. We are flexible. We, are, we do invest across a range of different stocks. 
And I think you should look back over a 20 year period and say, I expect Forager to perform whether those big value stocks are doing well or whether they're not. It's our job to get out there and invest your money in the most attractive parts of the market, be that traditional value or traditional growth. Well, we're at the fun part, you could say, of the Forager 2021 Roadshow. We have the team here to answer any questions that you may have, and you can submit those questions still. And we've got quite a few lining up here. So joining me is the whole Forager team. We have Steve Johnson, Chief Investment Officer from the International Sheriff's Fund. We have Portfolio Managers Gareth Brown and Harvey Migotti along with senior analyst Chloe Stokes. And from the Australian Shares Fund, we have senior analysts Alex Shevelev and Gaston Amoros. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have everyone here, virtually, of course. Uh, let's get right to it, shall we? This first question is for you, Steve. Good thing you're on screen. It's from an anonymous att attendee, but a long-term investor in both funds, saying congrats on the performance. I just want your view on the value mantra of both funds. Do you think it's changed over time? Do you still actively look for deep value contrarian ideas or do you tend to look for safer options, Steve? You scared me when you said anonymous there, Nadine. I thought it was gonna be a, a very <laughs> angry question. Uh, look, I, I think I just addressed that in that last question as well. I do think one mistake here over the past 10 years was to be aggressively contrarian all of the time. We've made huge amounts of money about being from being contrarian at the right point in time. And I think you'll see when you see most of the new ideas or even all of the new ideas coming into the portfolio, there should be an angle into something there that we understand that we think the market is getting wrong about that particular stock. But we can apply that across growing businesses and, and shrinking businesses and all different types of businesses. And I, I think you should expect a better balance here between you know, cash generative traditional deep value stocks and some more liquid growing businesses that give our portfolio some really important attributes into the future. That will probably be increasingly so if those and as those funds continue to grow over time. Thank you, Steve. Uh, stay put because the next question is for you as well. It's from Ronald who says, thanks to you and the team for all your hard work. So I'm going to be giving you a few compliments if you don't mind, if you can bear it. Uh, but Ronald says, given the size of Australia versus the rest of the world, where do you see more opportunities going forward, especially with uh, rich valuations out there? Look, I, I think the opportunity opportunity set globally is obviously much bigger. And you heard from Chloe in today's presentation, I think when you're someone who's got a, a very unique circle of competence, uh, but in the early stages of your career quite narrow, global markets give you hundreds of opportunities, even within a narrow niche. And there's probably 200 stocks in a fairly narrow universe there that she feels like she's got an edge on that you wouldn't get if you were just investing in Australia. I think that is an advantage for us. And again, particularly as the fund grows to a larger size, that diversity and number of opportunities is, is really important. Having said that, you know, we've got a long track record here in Australia of, of doing very well. And I think the other thing that works very well in financial markets is experience and really deep expertise and patience in, in one particular market. And I think we can put together a a portfolio of 20 to 40 stocks here in Australia that performs very well. And we see the same themes that we see globally playing out here as well. So I don't really favour uh, one over the other. I think the opportunity for us as a business and for you as our clients to grow is clearly going to be internationally because of the capacity constraints that we face here. But in terms of returns, my expectations for both are uh, that they will both be well above market. Okay, good. Uh, thanks, Steve. Just stand by because the next question is for Gareth. Uh, saying, with the positive publicity Forger and the International Fund received this year, which you no doubt appreciate, Ian writes, is the International Fund near the por point where, like the Australian Fund, it would look to limit funds under management, despite, of course, the benefit that would come from fees, in terms of the ability to invest sufficiently quickly? Yeah, it's a good question. I, we uh, we think we can manage. We're only managing about 200 
50 million today. We think we can probably do four or 500 million without significant negative impact from that. Um, I think maybe at some point north of there will consider soft close, which might look something like no new investors, existing investors can, can continue to add. I think it's just important to point out that about fund, funds under management has come from, from the retention of profits and reinvestment rather than from inflows. We're definitely not getting flooded with inflows at this point. And uh, we're, we're happy to take some, but we haven't we haven't been flooded. It's mostly been the reinvestment of um, performance so far. All right, uh, Ian, I hope that answered your question. The next one is from Niraj, and this is for Harvey, um, saying some of the ideas in the international portfolio that were spun off recently that the international fund acquired aren't yet making a profit. So Harvey, what opportunity do you see with these types of companies in what might be a pricey market that makes you continue to hold some of these names as a significant holding in the fund? Um, it's obviously a really good question. I think we look at where the company is going to be in a couple of years rather than where it is today or where it was last year. You know, Marcus is obviously forward looking. So if we see tremendous potential in a business um, and prospect for growth where the, the market's not appreciating where this where it could head, we're happy to, you know, invest in it. And as long as we can see that they're growing sales and that's dropping through to the bottom line, we're more than happy to own the business if it's attractively valued. So, you know, an attractive idea isn't just something that's cheap based on the last 12 months earnings. It's something that is cheap as a going concern and as, as, as something that, you know, we're going to look at over the next 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, Amazon was not profitable for a good 20 years and it's been one of the best investments that we've, that we've ever known, you know, in the world. So um, that being said, you know, Pretty sure that most of the businesses that we actually own are um, generating good cash flow already today or profitable. We have very little names that are um, conceptual or, or, you know, I would say hyper growth and, you know, maybe profitable in 2030. We don't have many of those in the portfolio, but we're happy to hold them at the right price. Yeah, then, just to add to that really quickly yeah. as well. I think investing and in having some form of variant perception is, is all about seeing something that is not obvious. And I think a really good category for that is stocks that are not reporting accounting earnings where you think they're creating a huge amount of value and that ultimately that value is going to become obvious to everyone else at some point down the track. So it's a real bucket for us, not something that we look at with fear, but we look at with opportunity. If we see a business where we like the business and we like the growth prospects and we think it has prospects to be something extremely valuable, the fact that it's not reporting accounting profits at a particular point in time is actually a reason for us to get excited about it because it may be a reason why other people are not looking at it or dismissing it as an opportunity. Yep, got it. All right, um, Alex, time for you to sit up. The next question's for you. Uh, again, we've got Niraj asking about AMA, seeing it's had some financial impropriety issues, as I'm sure you're aware. A number of analysts, including your former colleagues, are recommending exiting. What opportunities and risks do you see to keep the stock as a top five holding in the Australia Fund. Hi Nadine and thanks Niraj. It's, um, it, it's something what we tried to cover a little bit earlier on here as well. The business has had an issue with the CEO prior. Um, that CEO has now left and I think the person that has replaced him, Carl Bison, is very well experienced in the space and importantly, uh, someone with experience in managing large businesses. So this is a business with now a billion dollars odd of revenue when things come back uh, post COVID. So we think we've got the right experience there now. And all the other interesting aspects to the business, they remain quite interesting. So it occupies a really interesting niche for the insurers. And we think that with that will come the earnings once they can get past this more recent issue with inflation of labor and parts. Thanks, Alex. Gaston, the next question is for you. And it's one that we're all sort of wondering at different times, and that is, of course, around the lockdowns. So with New South Wales, Sydney, now in seemingly indefinite lockdowns, 
how will that impact, how is it impacting the decisions that are being made around the Australian share fund? Well, if anything, uh, we think it's uh, opening up opportunities to add a few names uh, to take advantage of what we see as a transient situation. During the presentation, we talked about Univail. That's one that we added uh, recently. Um, and we're in the process of adding another one, which I don't think we have disclosed, so which I will not name it. Uh, and of course, we have existing holdings uh, that we talked about before uh, in experience and tourism that uh, were, as Alex said before, the, the, it's just a delay, it's a delay of a few months in terms of getting to the end point. But we see this, this as, a, as an opportunity to, like, uh, to capture good, uh, good gems out there. Steve, question for you coming from Simon. Get ready. He says, I realize that it's a market issue impacting a number of lists, listed investment trusts, but can't you do something to close the NTA discount from over 10%? He's suggesting to maybe 5%. What about an annual offer to holders to tender their shares near NTA and you buy back a total, potentially 10%? Holders could decide whether to sell into it or not, and you would create demand from traders and other holders to buy shares ahead of and after the buyback, thus keeping the traded price closer to the NTA. Thanks, Simon. And look, there's a couple of ideas there that we have given consideration to and are constantly giving consideration to. I really want to uh, let the, the process that we have underway run its course to some extent first, and that is further returns and getting this vehicle back to paying big distributions in line with the returns that it's making. I think that is really going to draw a tangible connection for people between the returns that the fund is making and what you get as an investor in it. To the extent that that doesn't work over the next 12 months and this vehicle is still trading at a discount, I think we are going to have to consider other ideas. I think every single one of them where we are providing liquidity is a, a step away and they can be small steps or large steps, but whatever you do, it's a step away from the perfect vehicle for us to generate returns from, which is a completely closed-ended vehicle. Now, maybe you know somewhere in between or some hybrid needs to be the, the answer here, and we, we make sure that we're getting the benefits uh, of that vehicle in dysfunctional markets. But I, I do think we can create an active market for this fund where people are looking at it and saying, I'm going to get above average returns from this uh, investment in the form of cash if I want to take them that way why would I not pay NTA for it? I really want to try and make that work in terms of us having a, a liquid market at or near net asset value here and us re retaining the benefits of having a properly closed-ended vehicle. Thanks, Steve. Chloe, we've got a question coming in from David for you. Uh, he asks, do you think Boohoo will materially affect or be affected, excuse me, by competition from Shine? Uh, interesting question. Thanks, David. Uh, Shein has been in the news a lot lately, and I think it could definitely be one of the things weighing on the Boohoo share price. There are articles suggesting that it's a $10 billion business, so it's obviously going at a phenomenal rate. But the way people speak about it is as though the business just started months ago, when it's actually been around for ages, and as have a number of other great online competitors, and I think they'll continue coming. But it's a huge space and there's plenty of scope for both of these businesses and plenty of others to succeed in the growing online market. Thanks, Chloe. So it's Sheen. I mean, everybody is talking about it. I should get that right. <laughs> uh, thanks for the question, David. Listen, there, there are still more questions, but uh, I'll bring this part of the 2021 Forger Fund Roadshow to a bit of a pause. I'm going to leave you, though, with Steve, who will go through and answer on more of your questions and continue the conversation with the rest of the Forager team. You're watching the 2021 Forager Investor Roadshow.